We're talking today with Mike Cowenhoven of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Mike, start us off with some background on yourself, and to start with, where and when were you born? Well, I was born in a little town of Tracy, Iowa. Mm -hmm. My father was a minister, and he took a church in McBain, Michigan. So we moved there, and I was my fifth birthday, practically on my fifth birthday, and I spent my fifth birthday in, in bed because I had a very bad case of scarlet fever. Oh, my. And uh, they, they, in those days, they quarantined you, and my mother took care of me, and my father moved upstairs in his, into his study. And, but anyway, I went through school in McBain. Okay. So from now, kindergarten through, through 12th grade. All right. And what year were you born? I was born February, February 8, 1926. Okay. So it's 1931 then that you moved to McBain, Michigan. Okay. Now, when you had scarlet fever, did they have to burn all your toys and clothes and things no, like that? No, no, it wasn't that bad. Then. Okay. But, uh, Yes, we were quarantined. My father look, looked at me every now and then through the bedroom window because he, he moved upstairs into mm -hmm. his study and my mother made his meals and put them on the, you know, on the steps and going upstairs and they could be closed off completely. Right. And uh, he came down and picked up his meals and so on. Okay. All right. So you grew up in McBain uh, and... Uh, let's see, so your father was a minister, and of course this is during the 1930s, so what kind of a living was he earning in those days? Well, I've got some records of his, and he earned uh, $100 a month, and there's a couple of couple months that he would turn his check back into the church because the church needed it worse than he did, mm -hmm. let's put it that way, but $100 a month was it. Okay, all right, and now do you remember uh, how you heard about Pearl Harbor? Yes, it was Sunday morning. My father was upstairs in his study getting ready for church, for, for a sermon in church, and I would turn on the radio and they had news, news break that Pearl Harbor had been bombed by the Japanese. So I raced upstairs and told my father and he said, oh yeah, he didn't even seem too interested at the time, never believing that maybe his son, his only son, would be in the safe service someday. Okay. Now, before Pearl Harbor happened, uh, did you pay much attention to the news in the world, or did you just mind well, your own business? Well, more or less, mind my own business, yes, but uh, yes, I did pay some attention to it. Okay. My father was concerned about me going into the service because I was an only child, and, and I was a boy, and so mm -hmm. on. And so, but otherwise, okay. no. All right. Uh, and then, I don't know, did the family have any connections in the Netherlands, or had you been in this country too long for that? No, my mother was born in, in the States also. She okay. Born right. in South Holland, Illinois, and my father too. Okay. All right. Uh, now, once the war started, uh, now did that change things at all in your community? Did you notice much difference? Well, not an awful lot, except that uh, things were hard to get. Sugar was hard to get. Uh, Cars were almost impossible. Uh, gas was rationed, uh, but my father, but my father had, to, being a minister, could get almost as much gas as he needed or wanted, mm -hmm. uh, which he didn't use very much, but he did use some. Okay, and I did too, for that matter. Right. But I went all the way through school in in McBain. Graduated on Thursday night in a class of seventeen, and. Uh, the next day, I had my notice for induction into the Navy, and five days later, I was in a, I was sworn into the Navy. Okay. Now, where did you do your basic training? Great Lakes. Okay. And where is that? In Chicago, suburb of northern suburb of Chicago. Right. Okay. Uh, and what did the training there consist of? Training was just basic, and as quickly as it is possible, because they were starting their big way through the islands into the Pacific and they needed as many Navy men out there as possible. Okay. So uh, so what did they teach you in that basic training? This basic training was just marching, a uh, uh, little bit of rain, shooting duty, uh, duties and not much of anything really, just how the Navy operated and what to do in the Navy. And so okay. On. How much emphasis was there on discipline? Well, that was important of course. 
the discipline. We were in a, in a barracks with our company was in a barracks, top floor of the barracks. We had another company below us. When I came out of uh, Great Lakes, I was just an ordinary third class seaman. And I was immediately put aboard a train to, to uh, California, San Diego, California. And I was there only a few days and I was put aboard the USS Franklin, which was a brand new carrier at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was mainly used at that time you know, as a carrier for replacement people. Uh, and planes. Planes was on the, on the deck and, and the hangar deck was full of plane, plane parts and so on to be transported to Pearl Harbor. And we, uh, we were transported to Pearl Harbor. I don't know how long it took us to get there, but... Uh, all right. Now, when you um, sailed over to, to Pearl Harbor, uh, was the weather good, or...? When I ever sailed between Pearl Harbor or uh, the States and Pearl Harbor, the weather was always rough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a rough piece of water, uh, and it was rough then, too. Uh, but, uh, yeah, board a big carrier like that, it doesn't make much difference. Uh, okay. Not that roughness. But in a destroyer, like I was on later, mm -hmm. that made a difference. But, sure. Yeah. All right. Now, was this the first time you'd ever actually been on a ship before? It's the first time. I was at Pearl Harbor, I think, about uh, five days, and they took us down to the boat basin, and, and um, they said, that's the ship you're going on. And it was lying at anchor there in Pearl Harbor, and that's the first time I ever saw a Navy ship or at all, really, except for the one I was on, mm -hmm. but uh, otherwise, no. All right, so what ship did they put you on? They put me on the USS Black D666, and right away, and I was put on as an ordinary seaman. And soon, they, soon after I was put on board ship, they needed, the, we need following people for strikers, what they call strikers. In other words, they, it was uh, people to, to do certain duties aboard ship. And one of them was radar, and I told a seaman next, next to me, man, I, or the, he wasn't a seaman really, he was, he was a crew member of the black. And I, man, that interests me. I'd certainly like to learn something about that. So he said, well, go ahead. Tell them that you'd like to become a striker for great art. And I said, oh, man, that's pretty awful complicated and so on. He says, no, nah. he says, try it. So I did, and they put me on as a striker and, and, and a radarman. So I became a striker, and I was a... Uh, All right. Now, what now did they What did they have to teach you? Well, they told me everything about it brought radar. We had two, two radar... Uh, Things That's, aboard ship. Mm -hmm. One was a surface search, and the other one was air, airplane or mm -hmm. sky search. And uh, to everything that I, I learned about radar was taught to me by by radar men. The fact is, the man that taught me was uh, first class radar man. He was real good, and he taught me everything that I know about radar today. Okay. Uh, how long did it take you to learn how to use the system and work on your own? Almost immediately, I was put aboard, aboard, aboard the console of, a, of the that were air search and surface search, and told how to run a thing and and uh, run each one and so on and what to do about okay. running it. Now, about how um, how accurate or reliable was the radar? I mean, how far away could you spot ships or aircraft? Well, ships were spotted as far as the curvature of the Earth. Air search, airplane search was quite far too, but it was, I don't know how far away, but when we could see a plane coming in, say at 20 miles or so, mm -hmm. or even maybe 30 miles, depending upon the weather somewhat, uh, we would follow it in, and then once we, they got within about uh, 10 miles of the ship, why we would turn the, the uh, search over to the gun mounts, and they had <coughs> they had to search to <coughs> excuse me to uh, fire the, the guns 
five inch guns. They had five five inch guns aboard and, and the ship. And they were turning the fire control over to, we would turn them over to fire control and they'd pick up the, they'd say, okay, CIC, Combat Information Center, mm -hmm. was where the radar was. We have them and they would follow them in and we would transfer back to trying to find any more okay. enemy ships. So, ship uh, planes. so for the gun, the gunners then, do they have, were they using your radar? Or did they have just visual sights at that point or? Well, the men that were on man the guns would have a physical uh, sight of the planes that came in okay. when they became in sight, so right. to speak. Okay. But the radar would still follow the uh, fire control radar would follow them in and start firing as soon as they were within range of the five inch guns. Okay. When uh, when I was a soon aboard ship, I was put into the CIC Combat Information Center, which is the nerve center of the ship when we're in combat, mm -hmm. particularly. And uh, I was put aboard air search, air search, which was on a table like this with the degrees of the compass on it, mm -hmm. and and uh, the man that was on the radar search radar would pick up a plane. I have a bogey at so, so many miles. Uh, at so at vector, whatever it might be, zero three zero, and, and it's at thirty. It's at twenty miles now, and um, it's flying. And I would put an X at twenty miles on the vector that was on. And a few minutes later, he'd give me another one, and I would put another X there, and another X, and then we join the three, and I could tell which which direction the, the plane was going in, the mm -hmm. plane or planes were going in. And I would transfer this to the bridge, and they would, uh, well, first of all, the, the fire control would try to get on them as much as possible. But we always had a combat air patrol flying above us, and that would be told that there was an officer across, and he would be in contact with them, and he, was, he would tell them about this, and they would put him on a vector to intercept them, mm -hmm. and the combat air patrol would say, okay. Tommy Gun, that was our radio call name. Tommy Gun, we are on them, and they would take off after them. Okay. That's when we were in combat. Then, in other words. All right. Now, um, just for the benefit of people who just don't know much about Navy ships, here the Black is a destroyer. Can you f describe it sort of physically? What did it look like? Yeah, well, a destroyer is uh, it's it's a fighting ship from beginning to end. We had the biggest guns on was five inch. We and then we had five mounts of five inch inch guns, and we had, uh, I don't know how many amounts of double uh, 40 millimeter, which was boom, 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 mm -hmm. boom, 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 like that, 40 millimeter, and then we had some 50 caliber on board too. Mm -hmm. We had a full arsenal of uh, yeah, torpedoes. Depth. Torpedoes, we had uh, eight torpedoes aboard ship, I think it was eight. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, Death charges for for, for submarines. Uh, it was packed. It was thirty about three hundred feet mm -hmm. and about three hundred men aboard ships. So it was pretty full uh, of everything, right. guns and and men okay. to man all these. All right. Now, when you left Pearl Harbor on the Black, were you sailing by yourself or were you with a larger group? Well, it was the crew, bigger yeah. crew, yeah, aboard ship. And, right. uh, but did the ship go alone or was it? No, we went along. Went from Pearl Harbor to Pearl Harbor, from uh, San Diego to Pearl Harbor. Uh, but when along. you left Pearl Harbor, though, that's when you oh, found Pearl Harbor. Harbor. Yes. Well, after I was came into Pearl Harbor on board this aircraft carrier, then mm -hmm. we were put off again. Right. On on uh, on the black. Uh, no, we were put off in first. Well, about yeah. Five days. Right. On uh, in a barracks, and then they said, "Colin, over right. you're going out today." So right. I was brought down to the boat basin. And um, there's the black, that's where you right. go. So I went aboard the black and I immediately became a, a great member of the black. Right, okay. So basically we had gotten that far in your story. So now I'm asking after you get on the black and then you set sail out of Hawaii. Then, then you're, you're with other ships. Yeah, you're with other ships at that point. Yeah. And um, where were you going? We were going down to New Guinea. Okay. And we were with several ships sailing on New Guinea. And I, 
we went across the equator, and then that was one of the things we, I was a polywog, what we call a polywog, never been across the equator, and they had, uh, in, uh, King Neptune? No, well, that was, that was part of it, they had the in, initiation right. into, the, into the royal order of, of uh, King Neptune. Mm -hmm. That was quite the thing. Uh, everybody that was going across for the first time I was in this, and the regular crew member that had been across before were, were initiating us into the thing. I don't know if you want me to go into that. that was well, quite, you, you can describe that a little bit, because it's well, not very we familiar. Were, uh, all we were gotten up at daybreak, and we went down to the mess hall, and we the, the people or men that were shellbacks were in their bunks yet, and they ordered breakfast, and so we had to serve them breakfast in bed. That's the only time they <laughs> in their bunk, and uh, then we were uh, the initiation itself. Oh yes, then we were put on uh, scrubbing the deck with a toothbrush, and uh, so on, and our hands and knees, of course, and then uh, the regular initiation began, and we were soaked down completely with fire hoses and uh, and they, about a dozen or so men were lined up on the deck and uh, we they had uh, the fire hose which was about that big around or right or it wasn't a regular hose it was about that big around and uh, they had about 18 inches of fire hose and we crawled between had to crawl between their legs and we were powed and as we went through we were propelled from one to the other really mm -hmm and uh, to these dozen men that were there. Then we got up and we were brought before the King Neptune himself, who was a fellow that was dressed as a king with a mm -hmm. false hat, and he had a plunger on his, in his hand as a scepter, and, and his, his wife was a, was a fellow who was dressed in, in a white thing and a long robe and so on. And his, his his people that served him and so on and so forth were all sitting there in a row and we had, and King Neptune was there and he wanted to know who we were and so on and so forth and then we had, had to kiss his belly and he, it was pretty hot, it was, wow, it was an equator mm -hmm. and it was hot and, and it was sweaty and he had to kiss his belly and then, and then move on down to, to all the king's men at the end and then, then they had garbage which had been stored up for for two or three days strewn across the deck on the rear of the ship and uh, fantail and we had to crawl through that on our hands and knees and then there we were put a, put in a chair with the, the ring of a, of a boat mm -hmm. there and the, bo the bottom was taken out which is just that was quite easy to do and then they put a canvas in there and filled it full of water I mean, it was full of water from, well, it was about that high, I would say. And we sat in a high chair, and then the king's barbers worked on us, and they were, they would take uh, paint brushes, big paint brushes full of tar and, and, and gook and stuff, and so on, on your hair, and then they'd go through your hair over this way, and then this way, and then this way. So, you, you know, just, and then, and then you'd rot, take it out of there. Or no, then they, then you were dumped backwards into this this spring here, full full of water, and they, then they pull you up and they say, "What are you?" If you said polywog, well, you were dunked again. But if you came up saying, "They said, what are you?" And I say, "You say shellback," and then well, you're a shellback now. So you go and went out and you threw all your clothes that you had on away because it was. You never could get them clean again. You had tar on them at that point. Yeah, and you shaved your head because you couldn't you couldn't do anything else with mm -hmm. that hair up there, and, uh, and that was it. And the all the officers that had never been across went across went the same thing, uh, same thing the men did, and all the men just had a great time with this. They they thought the the shellbacks, but anyway, all right, we did went you? to New Guinea, mm -hmm. and in New Guinea, why we picked up three. Three, uh, no, we paid, we were put put in uh, duty sh shielding uh, troop ships going up, and we didn't know where we were going. Mm -hmm. We were going north, went across the equator again. I went across the equator six times, by the way, mm -hmm. and the very few times, uh, that's the only times I'd been across the equator, it was those six times. But anyway, 
and we took place took part in the shelling of the of Lady mm -hmm. Island of Lady, and uh, then the troop ships were troops were brought in by their Higgin boats and landed on the shore, and, and then we were relieved and we came back to Pearl Harbor. Okay. Uh, now, when the invasion fleet is heading toward the Philippines, I mean, how much of that could you see, or what did it look like to you? Well, it was a, it was quite a quite a sight. Uh, the destroyers are are seal, shielding ships, and they were arranged around the big group. Mm -hmm. Then we had the cruisers and battleships were in the next ring, and inside of this, inside of them was the troop ships, mm -hmm. and the whole thing was brought into. Lady Gulf that way, and then the bigger ships were there to bombard the beach and to help in whatever way they could, and we were sent back to New Guinea. Okay. When we came back from New Guinea, I was sent to Pearl Harbor again. Okay. Now when you went into Lady, uh, did you spot any Japanese aircraft at all, or on no, your own? No, we never had any trouble. They never had any trouble at all, the landing. The landing was very quiet. They didn't even have to, but we pulverized that beach, I'll mm -hmm. tell you, boy, there, all these ships were lined up there, big ones, car or not carriers, but uh, battleships, uh, cruisers, light cruisers, and destroyers, and we all bombarded the beach, and it was pulverized, because right. they didn't know what was there, but nothing was there. They were f several miles inland before, the troops were several miles inland before they met their first combat. All right. Uh, so there's a lot of noise, but not a whole lot of danger at that point. No, and then you left danger. right away. Okay, so then your, your ship leaves, uh, and where do you go next? We went back to Pearl Harbor again. For New Guinea? From New Guinea. Well, we went, no, we were relieved. We, well, yes, that's right. Philippines? I, for the Philippines, the landing of the Philippines, we were relieved and sent down with another, a uh, couple other destroyers to New Guinea to pick up three refrigerator ships. Mm -hmm. Which we escorted back up to Lady and for for the troops to have. All right, All right. and they were full of mutton. Okay. Now to this day I can't eat any mutton. Well, well, I don't know what 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 were you eating on the destroyer? What were they feeding you? Well, they, we had pretty good meals. Um, the fact is, uh, we had pretty good meals all the time I was on the destroyer. On the destroyer, USS Black. So when did they make you eat mutton? Well. They fixed that when, when when they got some aboard. I mean, oh. that was just a side dish almost. You speak to me. <laughs> but, uh, no, we had we had pretty good food. Okay, all right. So uh, you you took the mutton back up to the Philippines. Yes. Okay. Then, right. And all once right. we got there, they were we were detached from this group, and we were sent to back to Pearl Harbor. Okay. And yeah. then from Pearl Harbor, we got to. Uh, Admiral Mitchner's fast carrier group, and we were sent to the big group to Okinawa. That's where we saw our main combat was in Okinawa. Okay. We were at sea for 84 days without a. We could see land at night occasionally, but we never landed on any, any terra firma, so to speak. So, from the time you left Pearl Harbor, then you go straight out to Okinawa, you don't land anywhere else, and now you're offshore at Okinawa. Okay. And I was a radar man then. I was a striker in the radar. Okay. Now, of course, at Okinawa, that's a place where there's a lot of kamikaze activity and a lot Very of stuff so. like that going on. Okay. So, as I guess, first of all, when you're going to Okinawa, were you going with the original invasion fleet in April? No. Or did you come well, later? Well, we were, we were with, yes, we were with the invasion fleet, but also we were with the, the again, the destroyers on the outside ring, inside ring was uh, was battleships, uh, cruisers, and light cruisers, and in the middle was uh, well, yeah, transports. Transports, right? Okay. And then, but now, Mitchers Force, thats aircraft carriers normally. Or aircraft carriers. I'm okay. sorry, it was aircraft. So you carriers. were with you. So you were escorting aircraft carriers at this right. time. Okay. Uh, so as that battle starts then, what do you see or what do you remember about that action? Well, we were with the uh, with the carriers and the battleships and, and cruisers, and mm -hmm. of course the destroyers were ringed around side of them. And there was four groups of us, four groups lined up, and they would sail along about a hundred miles or so off, off, off Okinawa, 
and then every day they would send off their planes to go over and, and, and uh, bomb uh, where the troops needed, needed wanted them on, on shore, and we would pick up planes that were taken off from Japanese planes that were taken off from Okinawa, and we were, we saw duty, and then they started the kamikaze thing really in earnest. They had tried it before, but mm -hmm. this was really in earnest. And they were quite successful at it. If they would have kept that up much longer, they would have had to abandon the, the uh, carriers and so on, because there was a lot of, quite a few carriers that were hit. Some of the big ones were hit, and, uh, and the battleships and cruisers, and some of the destroyers. They were after anything that was sailing out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they got the idea, the Admirals and so on I got the idea of putting cruiser or destroyers halfway between the Okinaw and the main group, and we would sail along with them in between, and we would pick up planes as they took off from Okinawa, and uh, we would have combat air patrol flying above us, and we would try to send them out to interfere, in, intercept the the. Uh, Kamikazes. Kamikazes. So, so the as far as you can tell, then the Japanese actually had kamikazes based on Okinawa. Oh yes. That they were launching at you. Uh, how long did that go on? I mean, did they? They went on as long as that Okinawa campaign went on. Okay. Because uh, the impression that I always had was that most of those came, you know, from Japan or so forth. Well, a lot of them did, of course, <laughs> and uh, they had. Uh, interfering groups or destroyers right. above there too, but okay. our duty primarily was off Okinawa. Okay. They had them on Okinawa too, which, which makes sense because yeah. they expected the attack. All right. Uh, now, how, I mean, how much success did you have in terms of spotting them or helping get them shot down? Well, we, we shot down nine, uh, nine Japanese planes. Three of them were kamikaze planes that dove at us. All three of them missed. One of them missed far away from us. Another one missed just off of our bow, blew up just off of our bow, and spread pieces of the fuselage of the plane mm -hmm. up on our decks. And I still got a piece of the plane as a souvenir. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but anyway, we so we had three kamikazes to dive at us uh, primarily. Okay. The third one that dove at us came straight at us, straight down, and we were throwing everything we had at them. And every and the other plane, uh, the uh, ships, uh, the another destroyer that was out there, mm -hmm. also, and we uh, were trying to hit him, and he he somehow got in and he dove straight at our ship, came down straight at our ship, and we thought that certainly he would hit us, and just above us he. At that, that day, we had two, two destroyers out there, by the way, and that day he leveled off and flew between the two, sh two destroyers. And we couldn't shoot at him because we'd hit the destroyer and they couldn't shoot, they'd hit us. And he flew right into the side of, the, of the, our sister ship, blew up in the, in the engine room, and so she was dead in the water. All of the radar men that were aboard were killed. They were, our CIC was on the main deck and they were killed, and, and some of the radio men on the deck above were killed, and even a few of the men that were in, on the, uh, oh, the bridge, or, bridge right, yeah. were, were injured, mm -hmm. and uh, the captain, in fact, was injured. But she was dead in the water, and so we threw a line up on her and started towing her back to the main group, and uh, when we, we entered the main group, and we all breathed a sigh of relief because we were out of that, and we no more and got in there and the Commodore came on and said, Tommy Gunn, resume your position. Mm -hmm. So we turned our way back out there. And then we were out there all by ourselves, which uh, didn't make much difference really. Because, uh, but anyway, we were out there for the whole Okinawa. Yeah. And that's about two months worth of fighting or something yes. that goes on there. We were at sea all the time. I was at sea for... 84 days without ever steady foot on land. Okay. Now, how do you get resupplied while you're on patrol like that? Uh, how do you get resupplied? Oh, well, when we went back to the main group at night and so on, <clears throat> mainly because that was free of 
free of planes or kamikazes primarily. We free of Japanese planes too, really. But anyway, we would be in the main group during the night. And every third day, we had to be resupplied with fuel f f to run the ship. And mm -hmm. uh, so they sent out refueling supply ships from Guam, and we would fall farther back in, during the night on the third day and get refueled and get Uncle Sugar mail and get all our eating supplies and, and ammunition that we needed aboard ship and so on and so forth, everything that we needed. And they would send out small carriers with, with planes aboard and they would replenish the, the big carriers with planes and plane parts and, mm -hmm. and things like that that, need, that needed. And then we would come back to the main group again. How would you get the? How would you get fuel from? The well, that was quite that was quite a trick which the navy had perfected. We'd pull up alongside a, a fueling ship, and they would uh, send over a shoot over a line from a gun, and it would land on our ship, and we'd pull it aboard, and then we pull pull up these big hoses about that big around with six to eight inch hoses, and we would we would get fuel from from them. Uh, through these hoses, um, and you, our supplies would go the same way. And Uncle Sugar Mail, we were always designated as the ship that took the Uncle Sugar Mail around to the other ships when we got back to the main group. So we would uh, always have big stacks of mail up on deck, and we would sail back, and we would arrive back in the in the main group in in the morning, and uh, would resume our stations in mm -hmm. the morning, and we would. Distribute our what we needed. Right. Okay. Are you talking about Uncle Sugar Mail, which presumably is U.S. mail, but just the code words for you and ask. Uh, how much communication did you get from home? Well, we had regular mail like this. It was regular mail that came across, and uh, I, I was. Everybody would get happy to get mail, of course, mm -hmm. and they even got some packages. Small packages came along with the mail, and uh, some of the men got packages. But yes, I had regular supply of mail from people I knew back in McBain would write me and knew my address out there, and my folks, of course, would write me faithfully. Mm -hmm. yeah. now, did you write back regularly? Oh, yes. When we went back to this group to, for refueling, why we always sent off our mail, uh, it was a two-way thing. They took our mail. And now, when you're writing letters, did you use V-mail, or did you just write regular, regular letters? Regular letters, right. Okay. And then did an officer have to read that? Oh yes, that was all read by, uh, censored. We could not put out where we were. Mm -hmm. We could put out most anything else, but not where we are or what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We could just uh, write just a nice friendly letter, really. Uh, so my folks knew I was in the Pacific. They knew mm -hmm. I was on the USS Black. And they knew I, where I was out there, primarily. And, but they didn't know anything where I was out there. Yeah. That's a pretty big area of water, you know, and uh, so they didn't know anything what I was really doing. They didn't know that I was off of Gunal. Okay. Now, because you were a radar operator, did you always have a pretty good idea sort of geographically where you were? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. We couldn't see land. We were all far enough from land, about 50 miles or so from, from land. Uh, but we we knew where it was. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were out on station like that, did you have any big storms come through? No. When I, we came back from from uh, Lady Gulf, back to uh, Pearl Harbor, we ran. We had a typhoon. We ran through the typhoon. I didn't think we were going to get through it. To tell you the truth, mm -hmm. this was the worst part of my combat duty. Was being because we. Our, our group, radar, radio, flag, flag men, uh, and so on, were all in the last compartment in the ship. All sea, sea doors were closed tight. All doors were closed tight so that you could not get from one compartment to the next. You couldn't get up on deck because they were closed tight. All ventilation was cut off because of water would come aboard and wash down the ventilators and so on and so forth. So there was water. Uh, so we were then there all by ourselves. We were in a coffin, really. If this ship went down, that was it. We were, there was no chance of getting out at all, none at all. Uh, if we went down or if we tipped over, which was a big thing that to 
could have done, that was it. We were doomed. And we were all just in our skivvy shorts because it didn't take very long. The air being down there became very heavy and very hot. Mm -hmm. And we just, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't write. You couldn't play cards. You couldn't read because it was just too rough. And so you're in the stern of the ship, so that's going to go up and down the most. Oh, yes. Right? Well, that was it. Uh, it. We were, our radar men were four hours on, eight hours off. So we had three groups. Four hours on, eight hours off. That was because of eyesight. They didn't want us to be on too long on mm -hmm. the scope. So it was four hours on, eight hours off. So when our turn came, we went up on deck to, we're, we're really in the, Big typhoon yet, where we went up on up there to, on deck and opened up the the door the hatch, and there was a wall of water going 50 feet up or better uh, up there. And we slammed the hatch up and battened it down and went back down and said, uh, the uh, telephone to CIC that the, you you guys are going to have to stay there because we can't get there, can't get forward. We had to go all the way forward, aboard on main deck. There was only one deck. You couldn't go below deck or anything like that, there was no way forward, or you couldn't go above deck or anything, or you, you had to go on the main deck to get there. And the water was just coming over the deck constantly. The big thing was, was one of the death charges, which is something like a 50 gallon barrel, mm -hmm. uh, broke loose from its mount and was rolling around on deck right above us, because we were the last compartment on the ship. And it was rolling around, and you go hit hit a hit a mount, and then it would go the other way right above us, and it hit hit the hit the railing on the side, and then back and forth this way. Well, it was kind of nerve wracking. I mean, because you weren't doing anything but just laying in your bunk and hanging on. Um, but first, pretty soon it broke through the the railing and went overboard. So that was it. That was done. With, that was done with it. That was a nerve-wracking thing, but we were in there for 15 hours before we finally got got through the thing completely. And uh, but we made it. Okay. We were supposedly, if your ship the destroyer rolls over and you take water mm -hmm. through the funnels, which is the main funnels of the, the ship, mm -hmm. you would take shipped water. You'd go on over. I mean, it would be that way. You'd go on over, and supposedly we went over and took just a little water and funneled, but we righted ourselves. We had a terrific captain during that time, and he knew how to run that ship. And we would go up one one side of the wave, and, and it would go. You could fight its way up, mm -hmm. and it would get to the top, and it would tip over. And we were right above the screws, and you could hear the old propellers turning. There had two propellers back there, and they'd turn and hitting air, and then all of a sudden it would bite again. You go down into the, the trough or whatever, trough of the wave, and then you'd start up the next one. It was a very nerve-wracking thing, I'll tell you. You couldn't do anything but just hang on. That's the only thing you could do. All right. And uh, yeah, there were several f or several few destroyers went over and were lost during that storm. Right. Okay. Now, you're talking about uh, your captain. Did you, did you change officers several times? Well, or? no. The captain was on there as captain. Mm -hmm. He stayed on. We did change after the war was over. We changed captains and mm -hmm. another Captain Simpson came on. And captain King was relieved and he went to a, to a cruiser as, as a okay. officer. Uh, how, what kind of relationship was there between the officers and, and enlisted men that are doing things like you're doing? Did you see much of them? or? Well, when we were on duty in, in CIC, uh, ordinary duty on CIC, we would uh, always have one officer with us at the time in, in, the, in the Combat Information Center. And uh, uh, the other time, the officers, they had gunnery officers, uh, Food officer, you know, supply mm -hmm. officers, uh, uh, machinist uh, officers for the machine rooms and the black gang, so to speak. Uh, the, so we had regular officers, but they had they had their own compartments. Mm -hmm. We were in a big compartment with 50, 60 men or men or better, probably. I don't remember how many were in that compartment, 
and there was three air, three bunks, mm -hmm. and uh, we had our own bunk, and and below it was it was, a couple, was for our our uh, food, our uh, fo our clothes and so on. Right. Right. And uh, but anyway, <clears throat> no, the uh, the officers were completely separated from the men most of the time. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. They yeah. would came come down the deck when it was nice weather to just to check on things and make things right or so on. But but no, they were, and CIC was located right next to the the officers' stateroom mm -hmm. where they had their meals and so on. So it was right next to ours. So we came out of the out of our and right there was the going into the stateroom. Now on the ship, do they make you salute the officers? No. Okay. No. And they didn't. We wore whatever we wanted to wear too on the on the big ships. I was glad I was never on a big ship because you had to wear uniform, white uniform, and complete, and a cap and everything like that. We never wore caps, or, and uh, we never wore uniforms. We were down in our skivvy shirts mostly because we were in hot weather a great deal of the time. And uh, so no. All right. And were the officers pretty good at their jobs, or were there problems among them? That I don't know about the problems. They were straight out of, uh, most of them were college fellows that were in college or graduated from college and they were given uh, this officership right. and they were immediately shipped out like with us and so they didn't know much about uh, really what was going on really in the, in the crew, you know. Our captain was a very good captain, but he paid no attention to the, to the men of the ship. Mm -hmm. That was his man that was immediately below him. He took care of the, of the men in the, in the crew, I mean, of the ship. But Captain King, then, and he was a big man. And you know, the, the passageway in, the, in these ships were grand and small, and a couple of fellows would be standing there talking, and he'd come down the passageway and he'd pick them up and set them aside. <laughs> He wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't say excuse me or, or say anything to us or anything like that. He didn't pay any attention to us at all. He just pick him up, set him aside. <laughs> but he was a good captain. He knew what he was doing and he captained the ship real well. Okay. After the war was over, we were he was relieved, and we had another man come aboard as captain. And he, well, we went into into a harbor in, in China after the war was over for waiting for orders to come back to the States. And uh, and he, we were going, we got orders to go back to the States and he, so our ship was going out and he had a, hit a junk going out and wrecked it and fin sent it to the bottom, so to speak. And uh, our regular captain would have never done something like that. Mm -hmm. He was good. Right. Let's go back uh, to the Okinawa campaign. Aside from that one day when you had the kamikazes coming at you, did you see any other ships get hit, or uh, were there other days where there was a lot of fighting going on that you saw? Well, when we were with the main group, when we were out there alone on picket duty, why well, we were, you couldn't see the next ship. That okay. that day that our sister ship got hit, just happened that we were out there, the two of us. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that was, but there was all two of us doing the picket duty that day, and uh, we were missed, or we almost yeah. got yeah. it, but the, the, she got it. Okay. But were there other days when you saw kamikazes and... Oh that? yes, very definitely. As they say, there's three of them that dived at us and we saw them go over over us, and of course we never saw them because we were far enough away from the main group that right. we never saw them dive so at us. Were those on three different days that that happened? Or was that all one attack, or were there separate attacks? The three kamikazes were three, three different days, yes. Okay, okay. All right. Uh, now, uh, the, so the, you're, you're basically you're, you're at Okinawa for around two months or so. Uh, now, after that, once you kind of get into June and, and the fighting on land is officially over, um, now do you prepare for the invasion of Japan, or do you get to go back to the well, States? Well, that's, or, <clears throat> yes. They, when they sent us into Okinawa because we had to <clears throat> run into something on our sonar. Sonar is detection of submarine ships. Mm -hmm. And there's a bell that goes below the ship where the sonar waves go out. And uh, we had evidently ran into something to put a dent in that bell. 
didn't didn't break it or it wasn't taking water, but it was dented, and they wanted to fix that. So they sent us into Okinawa to to uh, put us in a dry dock. Mm -hmm. So we were in a seagoing dry dock, which is a looks like a ship, but a, a dry dock in there, mm -hmm. and they take pump all the water out and put us. We were on blocks on dry land, so to speak, almost. Mm -hmm. And we were in there. All the water had been pumped out, and uh, we were they were getting ready to do something with the, the, the bell, and we got word that there was a, another typhoon headed headed towards Okinawa, Buckner Bay, mm -hmm. in Okinawa, and to all ships to, to to go out of the harbor as quickly as possible. So they pumped that water back in as fast as they could, and they sent us out. And so we got into just in the tail end of that typhoon. So I say it was in two typhoons, mm -hmm. but actually it was the first one was when, when we really, really went through a bad one. The second right. one wasn't as bad, but it was a typhoon, though. Now, did you ever get to go ashore in Okinawa, or did you just stay No, on I never got to go ashore in Okinawa. I never got to go to shore in Japan. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we saw Japan. In fact, is Kyushu, which was a southernmost island of Japan, they sent off a carrier from the main group to go into Kyushu, or go near the Kyushu, let's put it that way, and send off planes for them. For some reason, I have no idea what the reason was, but about three destroyers were screening this this carrier into Kyushu, and I saw Kyushu, could mm -hmm. see that, and they took off planes to go in. Well, there was a, they were, sitting off these planes and somehow or other a Japanese Betty, which is a Japanese bomber, which was a kamikaze plane actually, but mm -hmm. he was a bomber. This was a bomber who was doing bombing work. Got through our our radar screen. How this happened? Because everybody, all these ships had radar up mm -hmm. on them. And they got through our radar screen and would flow, flew in over the Franklin and dropped bomb on the Franklin and the Franklin was, was refueling and replenishing the planes and uh, refueling and putting bombs on, on the planes and so on at the time. And so it just blew up, boys, that thing blew up like you can't believe. And it went into the ammunition and fuel in there and blew up some more and it was on fire and completely dead in the water. And they, we went aboard, went aboard on, near her mm -hmm. and uh, took a lot of the men, all the men were abandoned ship was given order and the captain of the, of the Franklin radioed the com uh, Commodore of the main group and said I'd like to stay aboard if I could I think I could save the, save the ship mm -hmm. so he said well okay take a skeleton to the crew and stay aboard but if you start to go down get off mm -hmm. so they did he stayed aboard and he did save the ship and uh, one of the we were there with a couple light cruisers and they sent over a line from the cruiser and they put it under tow and we all went back to the main group towing the Franklin back and she went back to the States uh, for refitting and re repair. And she was in one of the ships that they were showing people could come aboard when they got back to the States to show one. I had thought that they wound up scrapping it. But, but not well, not that time. Not that time. Okay, no. so they managed because I know it was it was gutted pretty much. Yes, it was gutted completely. I don't think it ever got back in duty at all. I don't know they they were supposedly working on it, but I don't know whether it ever came back to. Well, the war would have ended not too long after that. that, right? Okay. Now, uh, do you remember hearing about the atomic bomb? Oh yes, we were off of well, and once we were through with that typhoon on, on Buckner Bay, while well, we went back out again. Uh, we were sent back out as duty off of Japan. Mm -hmm. Our duty when the Japan was, they were getting ready to enter Japan, invade Japan, mm -hmm. our duty was off of this, about 100 miles off of shore or so, and we were to sail off of Japan shore about 100 miles out, and uh, when they went over with uh, parachute or if anybody was shot down or so on in there, we were to pick up all right. survivors. Right. And the, uh, what are these things that uh, flew without engines? I can't even think of the name now. I had, but anyway, well, gliders. Yeah. Yeah. These gliders would come over and if they were came down at sea, why we were to pick up all the 
And, okay, and, sure, and so sure. Okay, using gliders for the, as part of the invasion force. And uh, we were out there before that, of course, mm -hmm. because they were sending planes over to Japan constantly. Mm -hmm. And um, they, after our, uh, yeah, after Okinawa, mm -hmm. we were still out there shielding ships, mm -hmm. so to speak. And uh, the every once in a while, one of the one of the American planes would run out of gas, mm -hmm. or they'd have engine trouble, and they'd ditch at sea. Mm -hmm. And we were sent out there to pick them up, pick up the pilot. We picked up uh, two or three of them. Uh, one of them that I picked up was a, we picked up was a torpedo bomber, which is a two man, mm -hmm. two man plane. One was a pilot, the other one was a radio man, and so on. And he went down, and uh, we went we flew or went out to pick him up, mm -hmm. and he radioed that he was coming down in a certain ex place, and mm -hmm. so we were there and saw him come down, and when he came down, why the water went up, of course, and, and when the water went down. The pilot was standing on the plane, uh, but the radio man never got out. He went down with his plane. And that was after the war, by the way. Okay. And uh, we were on duty off, the, off of Japan. Okay. Now, did you hear about the atomic bomb before the Japanese surrender? Yes. We were at sea at, at, at that time, and we heard that the atomic bomb went off at uh, no, Hiroshima was the first one. Hiroshima. Yeah. And Nagasaki was the second one. Mm -hmm. but we we were both at, we were at sea at that time, and the atomic bomb went off and it destroyed the practically destroyed the, uh, Hiroshima, and there were thousands of people killed and everything like that. Why, man, what's an atomic bomb? We never heard of an atomic bomb. Yeah. You know, you know what? One bomb did all this, mm -hmm. you know, and then a few days later, why the second one went off in Nagasaki and the same thing. And uh, boy. Then they had the thing that the president said, you're going to be, in, well, they practically said you'd be annihilated if we keep on, when we're mm -hmm. going to keep on. Well, the thing was, they only had two bombs that it would work. Mm -hmm. And it took a while to make them, so they would, you know, but they didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought that we had all kinds of them, of course. And so they thought the better of it, to, they'd better give up. Okay. But I never got in on that. Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. Yes, uh, Iowa. It was the Iowa, wasn't it? Where the the went into Pearl Harbor or into uh, the well, there was in, the Indianapolis was the cruiser that carried the bombs out. No, but, the yeah, but, but the I mean, after the war was over, mm -hmm. they went in to sign the uh, right. peace treaty. Right. Aboard right. a ship. Okay, but your destroyer didn't go into Tokyo Bay. Never. I never got. I saw in Japan. As I said, we right. all laid off in Kyushu. And there was another one, the northernmost island in, uh, of the Japanese. Yeah, Hokkaido. Uh, we went up there too. They sent okay. us off there as, uh, with a cruiser. Mm -hmm. They sent us up there with a couple uh, shielding ships uh, up there to bombard a, a, a plant up there. Mm -hmm. and, and so we laid off of that island and they sent off planes to to destroy that plant aboard there, mm -hmm. and that plant that they I didn't ever just see the bombs go off. It was inland a ways and uh, so on and so forth. Never did see them, but the planes went off and back and back and forth and to the carrier, and uh, uh, so. But we were about ready to leave, and uh, we were sending off shells. There was a harbor. We couldn't see the harbor either, but they were lobbing the plant. The shells in there, mm -hmm. and so we and uh, a cruiser that was with us and so on, they lobbed planes or shells in there too, and there was a uh, supply ship came, Japan supply ship came out of the harbor. Mm -hmm. He was made to run up up the coast. He was going to try to get away. Mm -hmm. So we asked the the commodore if we could chase him and sink him. So mm -hmm. he says, "Yeah, go ahead." So we. <laughs> Went up there and, and sank him with our five inches. We didn't put a torpedo or anything in it. We just sank him with our five inches. Oh, well, he, he was badly damaged and he ran aground mm -hmm. to, uh, to save himself. But right. uh, we, so we got that on our, on our, in your record, yeah. Record okay. too. So where were you when the Japanese surrendered? 
We were at sea, mm -hmm. off of Japan, mm -hmm. waiting for Japan to, or for the United States to, to, to land. Yeah. Yeah. And then we got this. And of course, we were very glad. And then we went into Buckner Bay and uh, to, well, that was when the typhoon, That's the second, second typhoon okay. hit. Now you said you also went to China? China, yes. Then we were relieved of the duty, but they were taking over from Japan. Mm -hmm. And we went up into the Yellow Sea uh, between Korea and Japan, mm -hmm. our China mm -hmm. itself, between Korea and China, up into the Yellow Sea. And we were escorting a couple of carriers. And they, as we went up there, they would send off planes to, to, to monitor or to fly over these sites where the Japanese had taken over, mm -hmm. just in case they didn't want to give over up or they would right. bomb them again. So we went up there to the, in the Yellow Sea and then came back on the Chinese side. And we got down to Sing Tao, which was, uh, that was the name of the city at the mm -hmm. time, but it was not, it's not that anymore. But anyway, we went into that harbor, and there was a few other uh, ships in there with us, and waiting for orders to come back to the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, we laid in there for, I don't know, two weeks or something like that. And we so I got some dude, or... Uh, Did you leave? Shore, shore leave there? Shore leave there to go to Sing Tao. So what was that like? Well, that was pretty bad, because it was full of what they call white Russians. Mm -hmm. The uh, Russia itself was being bombed, and, and a lot of the white Russians had uh, were, weren't red Russians, so yeah. to speak, were had vacated the Russia, mm -hmm. and they came into this city, and so it was full of white Russians, and so there was a lot of them there. Plus the Chinese, Chinese were mm -hmm. there, but that was interesting. We got to ride in rickshaws and so on and so forth, and got some. Shore duty. Did you shore, see shore, shore any? Yeah. Did you see any of the Japanese military there? No, okay, just the Chinese and then the just civilians. The Chinese, that's okay. all. Okay, all right. Uh, and, and could you talk to anybody? Did any of the white Russians speak English? Or? Well, a little bit, but not much. Mm -hmm. Even the rickshaw drivers. They, when we got to go to shore, why they would take us in 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 uh, boats uh, to shore, mm -hmm. and we there'd be a whole bunch of rickshaw drivers there on shore wanting to want us to get into their rickshaw because they you know that was where they made their their money and uh, so on <clears throat> and it was poor in fact is I, I changed three dollars American into Chinese money and I got three thousand dollars of, mm -hmm. of Chinese money at that time but and I still got some in my drawer at home but anyway uh, I uh, when we got to shore where they'd all fight to get it just in their rickshaw and they had uh, Chinese soldiers there. They take off their sand brown belts and with the belt buckle sticking out here, and they slap it away. Boy, those poor, poor men, the Chinese, they, you know, and they were very poor. Every morning they'd go down the street and pick up the dead people that had, had died in the street. In the morning they'd have uh, horses in the wagon and they'd pick them up uh, if they went down the street. It was it was very poor and very, but yeah, it was well, land. <laughs> well, when you, you get you got into a rickshaw, what did they do? You just drive around the town and come back? Or? Yeah, right. And they would all at a regular trot. I mean, they'd never slow down. And you'd, you'd say, "Hey, hey, slow down!" You know, you don't have to do that. You know, they couldn't speak in English, but slow down. And they'd go on again. <laughs> and if you wanted to stop, well, you just got their attention to stop and, and they'd wait for you until you come back and, mm -hmm. and we'd go again, you know. Well, was there anything to stop and look at? Or? Oh yeah, there were stores that were open. Okay. Um, some, I always wish that I had bought a few. There were some of these small shoes that the ladies put on about mm -hmm. four inch long, you know. Uh, they were, their feet were bound when they were children. And, so that it never developed, and they'd hobble around on these four or five inch shoes, mm -hmm. maybe not even that big, or real small anyway. Mm -hmm. But they were in the stores and so on. I always wish that I had bought a pair to take back, but I never did. And did you try any of the food, or did you? 
Uh, none of us, we were told not to do that. Okay. <laughs> not to do, buy any food or of any kind at all, but to, they had shore stations there that we could go, the Navy store stations mm -hmm. where we could go to and get food when we wanted. Okay. Yeah. And did they warn you about things like uh, stay away from the women or stay out of bars? Well, I didn't say that, but the place was full of, uh, you know. Professional women. Special women, yes. yes. And they were all beckoning you from balconies or, or things to come into their place. It was full of it uh, mm -hmm. at that time. All right. Now, this tape is just about up, so we're going to take a break here. All right. Now, in your story, we got to the point where you were talking about being at Tsingtao in China and what you saw there. But you also mentioned, as we were um, switching tapes, that uh, there was an incident, an, an attempted rescue incident that uh, you'd left off out. Off Okinawa. We were off Okinawa. You right? were off Okinawa, and what happened? There, yeah, we're, there was a, once in a while, the plane would not be able to get back to the ship, and it, it ship, and it would go down at sea, and we were ready to. They had one of the, some of the planes, American ships that were flying back from Okinawa, had seen this uh, boat, so it was called. It was a life raft. Life raft, right, out there with a man in it. And uh, so they sent us out to pick him up, thinking maybe he was an American pilot. Well, we draw near him when he was a Japanese pilot. And when we came in to pick him up, well, he pulled out his pistol and was shooting at us. And uh, so we bring it back. We can't get near him because he's shooting at us. And uh, the Commodore back in the main fleet said, eliminate him and then pick him up. So we opened up our 50 caliber uh, machine guns and eliminated him and went in and picked him up. He was dead, of course, and, and uh, they searched him and uh, so on and picked up any papers that he might have had and so on. And then we threw him overboard. Uh, got rid of him again. But that was the only time that I saw any Japanese at all, really. Right. Okay. Now, uh, after your stint in China, then um, did you go back to the States from there? Went back to the States from there, right. Okay. And where did you land in the U.S.? Uh, let's see, I was uh, L.A. Okay. And when you got off the ship, did you get discharged, or did they send no, you back? No, we were on ship, uh, board ship, until your time was up. Okay. You had a service time, you, you know, and service aboard ship, and service in, in combat, and you got so many points, and when you got enough points, well, you were allowed to be go back. Right. And you were supposed to go back to the place where you were sworn in, <clears throat> which was in Chicago, or in Detroit, or yeah. Chicago. And, uh, but you could, if you wanted to, you could stay, get sworn in, or sworn out of the Navy mm -hmm. there. So I chose to get sworn out of the Navy right there. Okay. And you had to have a, a place of employment. But uh, so almost everybody aboard ship, by the way, did this. And they, they, because you were given, I don't know, $300 over, didn't, didn't cost that much to get across, mm -hmm. across the, the, United States, three hundred dollars, about a hundred dollars at that time, and uh, um, so that you'd have a couple hundred dollars left, you know. And plus, you had all this this time at sea, which we couldn't give them, a sort of accumulated on the, mm -hmm. on the on the books. So you had all that with you too, and uh, so, uh, but right outside the outside of the shipyard, Navy shipyard, there, there was a uh, cafe or. Something like that. A lot of the fellows would go to from the from this. So we'd go in there and say, "Hey, can, can you give me a letter stating that you'll hire me when I get out?" Sure. So he'd write a letter. I mean, he must have wrote a hundred, a couple other letters, <laughs> and so we show that to them. And okay, then so I was sworn out there in, in L.A. So, and, so how long did you have to stay with the ship in L.A. for a while first? Or oh, yes, I, do, I don't know. Not too long. Okay, it wasn't too long because I had sea duty. Mm -hmm. All right, better than a year. So once you got okay. So once you got out, then uh, what did you do next? Did you go back home or went back home? Okay, and then from there, when went from there, I went back home again, and uh, as a civilian, of course, and uh, um, 
I had graduated from high school, so I went to Calvin College for, for four years because I wanted to go into dentistry, mm -hmm. and that's a four-year course, a pre-dented pre Calvin, and I went through that for four years. I married him between my uh, soft, between my, yeah, my sophomore year and junior year, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we lived in Grand Rapids for, for two years. Our first son was born in Grand Rapids here at uh, a hospital here. And uh, then I would, was applied to Loyola University Dental School and I was accepted. At that time it was pretty hard to get into mm -hmm. these graduate schools. But I was accepted at Loyola and so I went to Loyola Dental School in Chicago uh, for four years and became a dentist. And then I would, my folks were born and raised in Lansing, Illinois, mm -hmm. and South Holland, Illinois. Mm -hmm. And so I had relatives there, so I decided to, I had to stay there. So I started my practice in, in Lansing, Illinois. And I didn't buy a practice, I started from scratch mm -hmm. uh, in Lansing, Illinois. And I was there for 36 years oh. until I retired. And then I moved up north where we came from. Mm -hmm. Well, we moved to Lake City, Illinois, which is our Michigan, which mm -hmm. is right on the shore of Lake Misaki. Mm -hmm. We built a, built a home on, right on the shore there, and we lived there for 20 years. And then five years ago, we moved here. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, to look back at the time that you spent in the service, uh, how do you think that affected you, or what did you learn from it? Well, it was the most... telling time in my, my bringing up, so to speak. I, I, in, now that I'm through it, you can't say that I enjoyed it, but I, I'm glad I was there. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't take a million dollars for my service career and my career over, overseas, but I wouldn't give you a nickel to go through it again. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was that that way. Our ship went all the way through that war and we had three kamikazes dive at us and we had a couple bombing runs made on us and, and uh, so on. And, uh, we never had a man aboard ship that was scratched. We came through without any screen at all. Okay. Everything missed us. Mm -hmm. I always say that I think it was God's work that did this. God said, well, you got the devil's number, but I'm going to make sure that the devil doesn't get you. Right. So DD-666 makes it all the way through the war. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to share your story today. Well, thank you.